Hey, hey, welcome back. It is Eric Arnold here in the sports slash politics barn on this Monday, the 21st of February. And we're going to have a combined episode here of both sports and politics because, well, uh, they things are just kind of merging together. And uh, as I keep uh, saying, that keeps happening despite my wish that it wouldn't. It just does. So, feel we need to talk about that. Uh, We're going to have three things here. We're going to touch on baseball. We're going to talk Juwan Howard, and then we're going to talk Canadian truckers. So Pittsburgh Louie, my guest handicapper from last uh, baseball season, uh, key member of this show, uh, he wants me to talk about uh, the issues uh, between the owners and the players. Ah, no, I'm not going to do it. I could care less. I could give a shit. All I know is with the money that's on the table for both sides, I expect them to make a deal now. This is ridiculous, It's but it's nothing new. So I, I'm not going to waste my time delving into the issues between millionaires and billionaires. Screw them. Uh, but of course, that's not going to happen. They're just going to screw us. So I've, I keep saying, and I'll say it again in case you didn't hear the last 17 times I said it, I fear that the owners look at that 60-game season from 2020 as a success. And the only thing that was missing was fans in the stands. In other words, if they had that kind of a sprint from mid-July through to the end of October, how exciting is that? Wow, we would have full stands, and who really gives a shit about these records? They're all no good now anyway, thanks to steroids. So let's just have a sprint every year and throw away these Tuesday games in May that the only body that really gives a shit about are people that gamble, right? I mean, come on now. Nobody really gives a shit about uh, uh, your fifth starter going against some a front man out of the bullpen on a Tuesday game in May. Nobody cares, right? That's what the owners are thinking. So, and I think the players, they're kind of like, well, we, we, you know, if we're making the money, I don't care if we play less games as long as we make the same amount of money. So I don't know. They're all care if they don't have April and May games. Um, Ultimately, as always, the owners have all the leverage. And the star players are the ones driving this, I think, the ones that are preventing a deal from being made. Uh, so, eh, you know, greedy on both sides don't care. I mean, the only thing I, know I could care less about is whether the Russians invade Ukraine. All I know is if I pay one more penny at the pump because of some Russian-Ukrainian conflict 10 zillion miles away, then I'm going to blame some people. You know, the, uh, we should not be involved in this. Should not be involved in it. But apparently uh, that my authoritarian uh, elites that rule me at the moment uh, want to get involved for their own reasons, certainly not anything that's going to benefit me. So, you know, that just runs itself. I have no control over that. But let's talk to Juan Howard. Now, who's Juwan Howard? He is the uh, coach, basketball coach of the men's basketball team at the University of Michigan. He's in his third season, former member of the Fab Five, the freshman, uh, five freshmen from, what was it, 1990, 91? I forget when they were all freshmen uh, at Michigan. That was like the first time uh, a college uh, played extensively talented freshmen and were good. Uh, these guys were also good and all went on to, well, I won't say all, but I think most, uh, at least three of them went on to very good NBA careers. Howard kicked around in the, uh, uh, I, or I shouldn't say kicked around. He had a very good NBA career. Then he was, I believe, uh, um, I don't think he was a head coach. I think he was an assistant coach at Miami and then the University of Michigan hired him uh, three years ago as their head coach. So 
Uh, he was involved in an altercation, I would argue, instigated said altercation uh, with the Wisconsin team at the end of the game yesterday on Sunday. Uh, Wisconsin blew out uh, Michigan up at Madison at the end of the game. Howard threw a punch and landed somewhat a slap punch kind of thing at the uh, assistant Joe Krabenhoff of Wisconsin. I don't know if he had something against Krabenhoff or he just happened to be the first uh, Wisconsin guy within arm's reach, whatever. So then a lot of things broke loose. Uh, at least two Michigan players throwing punches, at least one Wisconsin player throwing punches. I don't know any actually landed per se. I saw a lot of slapping and throwing, but I didn't see anybody actually drop anybody or see anything really make contact other than Howard's punch slap at Krabenhoff. That made contact. Uh, so what do I think about this? Well, here's what I think about this. One of my most popular videos I ever did, all I did was read an article, <laughs> which was my... Uh, uh, what the hell is this guy's name? He's been dead so long, I can't even remember his name. Uh, the guy that accused uh, now President Joe Biden of corruption. See, we forgot him. Oh, it's Bob Alinsky. Right, right. We forgot all about him. Uh, I read an article because he had been uh, memory holed by everybody in the press, YouTube, everybody. Uh, so I read the New York Post article. Well, I want to read something to you written by Jason Whitlock, who... I think he calls himself the most dangerous man in media. I might have made that up. He is, you know, he can say stuff I can't say. So I'm going to read what he says. I'm going to read what he says, and you can make your own decisions, yes or no, whether you agree, disagree, think it's horrible, whatever. But this is Jason Whitlock. Who is Jason Whitlock? Uh, he's a former, well, he's a current I call him a pundit. How about that? He's kind of like Stephen A. Smith. In other words, he, he used to be a sports writer, just like Stephen A. did. Just like Stephen A. Smith, he used to work at ESPN. Uh, ESPN got rid of him because his politics are wrong. Uh, so now I believe he works or is hooked up in some fashion with the Blaze, which, I mean, that means five of you get to hear or see the Blaze. That's, I think, run by Glenn Beck. Uh, so here... This is Jason Whitlock. Now, this is a little lengthy, so bear with me. I'll rip through it as quick as I can. But it, I think it's worth it. I think you'll enjoy it. Or not enjoy it. And be enraged by it, which, from what I've learned from the Howard Stern stuff, means you'll want to even hear more of it. And I may jump in here and then as I go through it. But, all right. Jason Whitlock. Michigan basketball coach Jawan Howard believes he's untouchable. And why shouldn't he? The rules imposed by our China-influenced institutions of government, education, sport, media, corporate and social, and art grant him a bigoted form of privilege. Howard is black, elite, and a supporter of left-wing social justice. He checks all the boxes for the elimination of standards, accountability, and adult expectations. Our current culture immunizes Howard from real consequence. He took the black scene, the black scene, uh, the alleged experimental cure for bigotry that injects people with the mindset that black people are inferior and can't be held to the same standards as white, Asian, or Latino people. Howard is fully blacksinated and boosted. He can't be touched. So that's some good stuff there, I think. Let's get some more here. We saw that yesterday in the handshake line after the Wisconsin Badgers routed Howard's Wolverines. In sense that Wisconsin coach Greg Gard called a timeout with 15 seconds to play, Howard yelled at and attempted to walk past Gard without the customary handshake. Gard placed his hand on Howard's elbow and tried to explain his use of a timeout. Howard responded by grabbing Gard's shirt in the center of his chest and then pointing a figure in Gard's face while repeatedly shouting, Don't fucking touch me! He says, don't effing touch me, but I thought I'd just clean that up for you. Players and assistant coaches separated Howard and guard. Moments later, Howard reached across several people and struck Wisconsin assistant coach Joe Krabenhoff. 
Howard's blow ignited a fracas among players from both teams. Howard's on-court post-game behavior was embarrassing and justifies a season-ending suspension. Here, let me stop him here. Now, this is something I think that uh, is maybe, I don't know, unprecedented. And, and in the spirit of trying to bring everybody together, both Whitlock, myself, and Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith, who's nobody's uh, a right winger. I would argue, he has said also, and I agree with Whitlock, Howard should be suspended throughout the rest of the season. That should be his punishment. All right, back to Whitlock. Howard's post-game interview was troubling and justifies his firing. Quote, I didn't like the timeout being called, unquote, Howard told reporters. And quote, I'll be totally honest, I thought it was not necessary in that moment, especially being a large lead. And then to have a timeout called, three to four seconds to go, I thought that was what I felt wasn't fair to our guys. So that's what happened, unquote. There was no timeout called with three to four seconds to play. Howard is confused. Given time to collect his thoughts, Howard had no real idea what happened at the end of the game. With 48 seconds to play and leading by 19 points, Wisconsin emptied its bench and inserted its scrubs, including several walk-ons. Howard instructed his players to compete until the final second. Howard pressed full court and caused a Badger turnover. Quote, it wasn't a press, Howard told reporters. We were just five. Pressure, defense, man-to-man. -man. That's what five is for us. So it wasn't a press. It was pressure, defense, man-to-man. -man. Got it. Howard was in a total fog during his post-game media session. It's like he blacked out. He lost the game and he lost his mind. Quote, for someone to touch me, and I think that was very uncalled for, for him to touch me as we were verbalizing and communicating with one another, Howard said. That's what ended up happening. That's what escalated it. Quote, unquote. Getting touched in a handshake line is not unusual. It's customary. Howard escalated the situation when he hit a Wisconsin assistant coach in the face. Quote, oh yeah, it was more than that, unquote. Howard responded when a reporter pointed out the point of a handshake line is to touch. Yeah, he touched me unnecessary. There wasn't cause for that when we were talking. And at that point, I thought it was time to protect myself, unquote. Five to ten seconds after being touched by a guard, Howard protected himself by attacking Joe Krabenhoff. It makes no sense. Howard sounds like a 12-year-old playground bully at best and a violent criminal with no emotional control at worst. What he did not sound like was a leader, an adult capable of counseling young people not to be easily provoked. You can't strike a man because somebody touched your elbow or stepped on your favorite gym shoes. Striking the Wisconsin assistant was bad. The rationalization of the act was far worse. How can Michigan have confidence in Howard's ability to lead? Howard has less emotional control than his players. Indiana fired Bobby Knight 22 years ago, ending the era of out-of-control bully coaches. 20 years before Knight's dismissal, Ohio State dumped its legendary football coach, Woody Hayes, for throwing a punch at a Clemson player. Things we tolerated and overlooked decades ago, we no longer do. The Don Draper, Roger Sterling, Pete Campbell, and Mad Men era is gone. Jawan Howard can't be retroactively grandfathered in. Replacing Mad Men with mad and untouchable black people is a mistake and equally harmful and racist. But that's what we're doing. We're codifying cultural norms that lower or eliminate all standards of behavior and achievement for black people. Now let me stop there. I note that Whitlock does not capitalize the B in black. Wow, that is revolutionary. I'm telling you, this Whitlock guy is just out there, man. All right, back to Whitlock. You can see it in the education system, the criminal justice system, and the sports world. Leftists are defining black people as incapable of meeting traditional cultural norms. We've been designed, defined as a special group worthy of the capital B that distinguishes us from the masses. The behavior, of black people has been de de uh, the behavior of black people has been deemed irrelevant. Only the action of white people matter. From the use of the N-word all the way to murder, we only care about the behavior of one group. 
white people. That's why it's forbidden to talk about the behavior George Floyd exhibited that contributed to his death, discussing Colin Kaepernick's career-destroying and illogical behavior is frowned upon, criticizing LeBron James or Barack Obama is an unforgivable sin. Floyd, Kaepernick, James, and Obama are untouchable. When people believe their actions are above scrutiny and irrelevant, their behavior typically becomes more erratic. That's what we're witnessing with Juwan Howard. I first met Juwan when he was a 19-year-old sophomore at the University of Michigan and the most mature member of the Fab Five. I covered the team for the Ann Arbor News. Howard was an impressive young person. He was mature, respectful, and classy. He had a huge heart. He brought his best friend from childhood, a kid everyone called Juice, to Michigan. Juice was small and smart. He and Howard were inseparable. At the time, it seemed understood that Howard used his athletic gift to empower and educate his best friend from home. I've always been impressed with Howard. I'm shocked to see Howard struggle with his emotions and behavior. A year ago, he had an over-the-top court, on-court confrontation with Maryland coach Mark Turgeon. Turgeon says Howard threatened to kill him. It was an ugly scene. Michigan took no disciplinary action against Howard. The team was nationally ranked and would eventually advance to the Elite Eight of the NCAA tournament. Howard should have been disciplined a year ago, but he's untouchable and he knows it. That's why he was so offended the guard had the audacity to protect his bench players from Michigan's endgame full-court press. Guard's walk-ons were getting overwhelmed and embarrassed. The final 48 seconds of a blowout are a walk-on's reward for practicing every day. Upset by the loss, Howard decided to ruin the reward guard gave his scrubs. When guard countered with a timeout, Howard emoted and eventually erupted. Joe Krabenhoff is white. Had he struck Howard, Krabenhoff would have been fired Sunday night. He would have been betrayed as the second coming of Derek Chauvin. Howard has somehow been cast as the victim. Calls for his removal as Michigan head coach are being framed as racist overreaction. For white bigots and black supporters of black inferiority, holding Howard to the same standard as a white coach would be racist. Like Hal Capone, Howard is untouchable. He will not be punished for his bad behavior. In a year or two, Michigan will fire Howard for NCAA tournament evasion. And that's the end of it. Nice line at the end there in, in, in that, that he figures they're going to fire him because he can't win games, but they won't fire him for this. <laughs> well, I don't know. So do I agree with what Whitlock has to say? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what he has to say. Absolutely. Um, we're, we're into uncharted waters here in, in that most head coaches of major programs don't punch guys on the field or on the court. It just is not really, you know, Woody Hayes, he punched a Clemson kid and he was fired before he, that happened in Jacksonville at the end of the Gator Bowl in December, I'm going to say just about like December 31st, 1978. He was fired before the plane landed in Columbus. But then, as a, a subscriber X points out, Ohio State was looking to get rid of him anyway in that, well, we were losing, the program was in decline. Every other, uh, you know, people talk about how the SEC teams uh, discovered last that they could bring in African-American players and they were good. Well, Ohio State was the last team in America to figure out that we could forward pass. Everyone else was throwing the ball and Woody's like, nope, if you throw the ball, three things can happen and two of them are bad. Well, they don't all happen in the same percentage, Woody, but you know that's how he thought. So we wouldn't throw the ball. We lost lots of games there in the mid-70s and they were looking to get rid of Woody. Um, it, it, Bobby Knight was a bully and a half. Uh, that was how he won a lot of games, just by bullying the shit out of the officials. Um, if 
he was looking to make a point or something, he would go full Bobby and, and just make the lives of the officials miserable. And just to shut him up, they would start to shade the calls his way. I don't know how to see it any other way than that. A lot of great coaches do that sort of thing. You know, there you got Mike Krzyzewski on the sideline and he's chewing my ass and I'm a, you know, a 30 something year old official. I'm thinking to myself, damn, I thought I saw that call pretty clearly, but this guy is, they're going to build a, his own wing in the basketball hall of fame and he's chewing my ass. Maybe I didn't see that right. Now, maybe I did see that right, and he's just t looking for an advantage. Maybe it's that. In fact, yeah, it probably is that. You know, it, it, these guys do that. There's no, uh, it's sports. There are no rules. There are rules, but there, uh, there aren't rules, if you know what I mean. In other words, if I can gain an advantage with the officials by just saying something to them, they all do that. And Bobby Knight, he was certainly... Uh, uh, one of those that was a master at that. So Knight never punched a, well, I guess the punch, he, he, he punched people off the court and they all covered that up and he was white, but then they got rid of him as Whitlock points out, what, 22 years ago. So I don't know what they're going to do to Howard as we're making this video. They still haven't come out with a punishment for him yet. To me, it seems pretty simple. You suspend him for the rest of the year and then you start next year fresh. Yeah, you know, he get, he's on then the uh, double secret probation that they put Knight on for a while. I think what the holdup is, is that Wisconsin's involved in this. So I think the Big Ten is making phone calls back and forth between Michigan and Wisconsin saying, all right, well, we want everybody inside the same tent here. We don't want anybody pissing outside the tent. So, um, what do we got here? How about one game for guard, uh, multiple games for the Wisconsin kid that threw punches, multiple games for the uh, Michigan kids that threw punches, and then uh, Howard uh, started the whole fracas. He gets the rest of the season. And then Michigan's probably going, whoa, no, wait a minute, the whole season for Howard? What about, like, just the rest of the regular season? And then Wisconsin's probably going, are you kidding me? And our guys are getting suspended? He started it. You know, so that's going back and forth. And the Big Ten's probably trying to get everybody on the same page. I read the, uh, the mea culpa statement from the Michigan AD, and it was a joke. You know, I read right through that. You've got to learn to read this stuff. In other words, you've got to read what it doesn't say. And right in that statement, there's a clause which nullifies the whole statement. It says, blah, 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 blah. Uh, regardless of provocations, or regardless of instigating circumstances, something like that. That negates the whole statement. In other words, the AD saying, well, now, you know, you laid hands on our guy and he needed to protect himself. So, but, you know, yeah, okay. All right, you guys, you can't punch. We, can, we get it. We can't punch a guy. But you started it. We can punch a guy. That's what Michigan's AD is saying. So the Big Ten, you know, they're telling uh, uh, Michigan, you're, you're gone for the rest of the season. Michigan's like, no way, no way. We'll see how this comes down. I'm curious. This, this is very interesting to see how this comes down. I thought it was more interesting that Stephen A. Smith, Jason Whitlock, and myself all saw this the same way. End of the season suspension. I don't think he should be fired. Frankly, if we were going to call this all the same way, I wouldn't give him any suspension at all. Let's have at it, boys. I love this shit. This is action. This is fun. I mean, nobody got hurt. It was just a lot of, you know, it, it, like I said, there's, no, uh, I, I want credit for this because I'm the only one I've ever heard say this, and it's true. It's profound. Nothing causes more fights in sports than the unwritten rules of sports. <laughs> Nothing gets more people pissed off when they violate the unwritten rule of sports. That's what's awesome. 
You can't call a timeout with 15 seconds to go. Well, you shouldn't be pressing my walk-ons with a minute to go. Well, I don't like you because I don't like you. Well, ha, 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 huffy, huff. I mean, I would love to hear what the uh, Wisconsin assistant coaches said in that scrum. I mean, I have a feeling it was something along the lines of when Howard's, you know, pounding on guard's chest telling him, don't fucking touch me. Don't fucking touch me. I'll remember that. You don't call time out. I bet they went just like, hey, go fuck yourself. You don't get to lecture us on sportsmanship. What gives you the, uh, uh, the unwritten uh, rule book key? Uh, we have our own unwritten rule book too. So, you know, I'm sure those guys were, they weren't saying, well, now, Jawan, you're right. We shouldn't have called time out. That's on us. We're sorry. I know they weren't saying that. So, <laughs> very funny. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, on to serious stuff. Serious stuff. Now, apparently, we have a full-out dictatorship now on our northern border. This caused a missile crisis. Uh, what? 1962, we had a communist dictatorship just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, Cuba. Um, does Canada have nuclear weapons? I don't even know if they do. Uh, but I do know that that country has now gone full dictatorship, just <laughs> caused by a bunch of Canadian owner operators. It's amazing. It's crazy. It, it's just hard to believe. I mean, now, if you missed it and you don't know what I'm talking about, and I know you Democrats are like, that's ridiculous, that's an exaggeration. No, it isn't. It really isn't. They have uh, invoked uh, some kind of Emergency Powers Act, which sounds like, you know, some bad line out of an Ayn Rand novel. But uh, I think that's what they call it, where basically Trudeau, the dictator, he can do anything. He can do anything. He can just point out somebody and say, you are a terrorist, and I don't like you. Therefore, I can put you in jail for... And the things they're coming up with to put these guys in jail are literally mischief. Again, back to a bad Ayn Rand novel. It's like, are you kidding me? You put him in jail for what? Mischief? What is that? Did he tie somebody's shoes together? What the fuck is mischief? What the hell? It's crazy. I mean, they don't actually have these truckers on doing anything other than like annoying shit, like honking their horns at all hours of the day and night. They don't have them on assault. They don't have them on all, any other number of felonies you can think of. They're just uh, basically using the same tactics that have been used uh, for decades, if not centuries, nonviolent protests to address uh, uh, political uh, grievances. But, uh, you know, that only works when you're protesting in some kind of um, representative government. When you're protesting to a dictatorship, it doesn't work. And that's what these truckers are finding out. It has worked, but not quite as much as they want. You know, these truckers have been successful in ways that nobody thought they would be. It's been a complete and total unvarnished success for the Freedom Convoy. They've gotten five provinces to lift these idiotic, ridiculous, stupid mandates. So they have pried their freedom back in some areas of the country. Uh, however, the national government, they're not going to give them the time of day. They're going to try to crush these people. This Emergency Powers Act allows the Trudeau, the dictator, to freeze bank accounts, to seize bank accounts. It, it basically, it empowers them to do anything. Uh, without any kind of, uh, apparently, parliamentary input, without any court input, from what I can tell. Um, I saw on the internet that some woman who's just a single mother who donated 50 bucks via one of the uh, go send fucker, PayPal, whatever, uh, uh, what are these things called? Give, send, go, or go fund me. Give, send, go, I believe is the... Uh, the one that does not censor you, the one that can be trusted. Give, send, go. So she sends 50 bucks. Now they're tracing it back, and they've seized her bank account. 
She's the single mother who gave 50 bucks. Oh, and this was 50 bucks before this guy declared that giving money was a terrorist act. So he's now retroactively declaring people who have given money to this convoy terrorists. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, who's the terrorist here? Her or you? Now, for you people, you moderate Democrats, you go, that's all overblown. I mean, it just, you got to do something. You can't have these trucks in the, the Capitol forever. You got to get rid of them. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, you just vote them out then. You just vote them out then. Seriously? Listen to yourselves. I mean, basically, what's in Canada right now is no different than the government in Russia, where Putin's been in charge forever. How is Putin in charge forever? Why don't they just vote him out? Why don't they just vote him out? Well, they don't vote him out because they can't. Because anytime they have an election, he's the only one on the goddamn ballot. Do you really think that anybody's going to seriously challenge this guy Trudeau? Uh, uh, he'll, they'll get an emergency act. They'll be declared terrorists. They'll simply be silenced. They won't be able to speak out. The, they controls the media. He controls all the national media in Canada. You know, what you got up there is a complete and total dictatorship. The only thing that saved our ass in this country, the United States, was the barest of Supreme Court decisions, the 5-4, was it 5-4 or 6-3, I forget which, that declared the Biden mandates unconstitutional. Otherwise, we would be having the exact same thing happening here. If we threw, and I told you people that, if we had 25, 30% of the workforce fired because they wouldn't get these experimental vaccine mandates, well then, what the hell? You'd have the same protests here, and Biden would be taking the same action that Trudeau is because Biden is a leftist thug just like Trudeau is. But luckily for us, the Supreme Court saved us from having that happen. Uh, I admit, the, we are not under the same onerous conditions that they are up in Canada. You know, we have a little more freedom in this country, and that's left just enough air out of the balloon that we're not having what's happening up there. You know, the, it's not over up there, unfortunately. I mean... It, I wish it would uh, not be the way it is, but you know, it, it, you may be seeing guns being fired above our northern border before you see guns being fired in the Ukraine and Russia. That's all I got for you. So, hey, thanks for being here. Appreciate you stopping by. Uh, hey, I'm hoping we play some baseball because I'd love to get back to those baseball videos. We were good at handicapping baseball. Get Pittsburgh Louie back involved, get some winners, get make start making some money. Hey, that all sounds fun. So hopefully these baseball people, this supposedly is a big week in negotiations. The excitement of labor negotiations. You think that Rob Manfred being a labor lawyer, we could get a piece here, bring people together and sing kumbaya, but I doubt that's going to happen. Hey, I'm Eric Arnold. I believe in free speech. We'll talk again. Thanks.